Welcome to Office Hours. I'm James Todd with Duke's News Office. I am here today with Father Mike Martin. We're talking about electing a new pope. And Father Mike, you know some of these cardinals who are at this moment at the Vatican preparing to set a date for the conclave that will elect the next pope. So what's your sense of what these men might be doing, thinking, even praying right now? First of all, James, thanks uh, for having me on today. I appreciate Good the opportunity. Um, yeah, and certainly I've met some of the cardinals. Uh, to say that I know them, I don't you know, want to overstate my own importance. But uh, I really think uh, that they're trying right now uh, in these pre-conclave meetings to get a better sense of what the issues are before the church in, uh, in the throughout the world, you know, so there are reports that are being given by various cardinals from the various areas around the world so, so that the man who will be our next pope, um, when he takes office, will have a pretty good understanding of what the issues are that the, the church faces around the world. So right now it's a lot of information sharing. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of uh, getting to know one another. These are men who uh, you know, are together from time to time at meetings, but they're about to make a very weighty decision. And so a lot of the informal uh, dynamic that takes place is just men trying to get to know one another at a deeper level. And so uh, I, I would suggest that that's what is really at the heart of, uh, of what's taking place in these days. And from your position here in Durham, what are some of those issues facing the church that the Cardinals might be uh, reporting on discussing? Yeah, you know, I think... Um, what issues there may be for students here on campus um, are similar issues that might be for you know a family in uh, in Thailand you know and so the, the the there are universal issues that the church deals with and then there are issues that are somewhat unique to uh, specific areas of the church like the United States uh, certainly a, a very large issue for the church is what we've been talking about for the last few years is the new evangelization and what we mean by that is how are we bringing our faith not so much to people who have never understood or never heard the faith before but in a newer sense how are we revitalizing our own understanding of faith for people who have been cradle catholics or people who maybe have practiced their faith at um in, to different degrees that maybe need to be called to a you know, a greater, uh, more in-depth celebration of their faith. So I think the new evangelization is something that the, the cardinals are speaking a lot about, how we can continue to revitalize uh, our belief in Christ and our celebration as, you know, one body of Christ, how, how we're living that out as a, as a people of faith. I think that's probably a lot of, uh, of what's being discussed. And for those of us reading the newspapers, it's hard to escape the, the bad news. Sure. Uh, so um, sexual abuse and responding to that, right. is that something you think is, is weighing in, this, in, this, uh, in the conclave to come? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think our church has been uh, certainly wounded by the wounds that we ourselves have inflicted on you know, innocent people. And so um, I, I not being able to speak for what's in the mind of the cardinals, but I certainly know that um, that the church is having some real honest conversations about, hey, we've got to always be looking at ourselves and saying, what can we do better? How are we at fault? Where do we need to do a better job of being accountable um, to the people that that we serve? And so um, that isn't just in the area of sexual abuse, although that was a you know a hard uh, and difficult time for so many people, and you know and still is. Um, but there are other areas where we have to continue to be uh, accountable to the you know to our own faithful as well as to the world as a whole. What will be some of those self-critical issues you think that the church sure. should, should be taking up? Well, I mean, I I, I wonder um, just from a personal perspective, I. I don't think that we're the best always at communicating what we believe and how we see the world. That's, I guess, more of a procedural issue. Certainly, there have been, uh, there's been a fair amount of conversation about uh, um, some of the ways in which uh, Vatican departments work and uh, the infrastructure of the church and how, how that all uh, is carried out. So I think there'll be some conversations about that. Certainly, the news has... Uh, has printed a fair amount about the Vatican Bank. Um, you know, the issues that the Vatican Bank would 
experience aren't all that dissimilar to you know Bank of America or some of the other issues. I mean, it's a it's a world class bank that you know does a lot of good, but also can fall prey sometimes to maybe not operating in a way that possibly it should. I, I'm no expert on the Vatican Bank whatsoever, but I do know that those internal structures are things that are certainly on the minds of many people within the church, and I, I would assume the cardinals as well. Could we've had some people uh, email in a sure. question, and so uh, this one is from Drew, and he says the church is currently facing a plethora of challenges. We've just been talking about that. Can you talk about the top two or three actions the new pope should make his key priorities as he takes office. Not conceptual priorities, what should he do? Right. Action items. Yeah, you know, I think um, that's going to be um, part of what is being discussed by the cardinals right now. I mean, uh, for me, not necessarily hearing what those presentations are, I, I think it would be premature for me to be giving the new pope some advice on what his first two or three action items It works the do. other way, right? Right, right, yeah, right. Okay. Exactly. He'll call me and, and tell me what I should be doing. But, uh, but I do think that um, uh, we've had um, two, uh, the past two popes who have been uh, exceptionally brilliant men, um, who have been able to articulate the faith very well. And you've met uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger, That's correct. Pope Benedict XVI. Yeah, it was a number of years ago. I studied uh, in Rome uh, back in the 80s and had the opportunity. He was then the what's called the prefect for the uh, Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And uh, he was very engaging and was able also on a number of occasions to meet his predecessor, uh, Pope John Paul II. And uh, again, just a very warm. Uh, and these are men who, just being in their presence, you get a sense that there's a holiness there that uh, is edifying. And so um, I, I really believe that, you know, action item number one is to continue to model that type of lifestyle that says these are men of faith who take their commitment to Christ very seriously and as such are worthy of our, um, um, our appreciation for who they are as men of faith who are leading our, our community. So I, I, I'm sure I'm not answering Drew's question the way he would want it to be answered in, you know, oh, the first thing the Pope should do is X. Uh, but I do think that... Um, uh, in any new position, um, we're always told, uh, wait a little bit, take some time, get the lay of the land, allow people to get to know you and you get to get to know the people with whom you're working. Uh, you know, they say, you know, don't change anything for six months, you know, walk a little bit gingerly. And, and I, I would sense that the, the Holy Spirit will be with the new Pope to guide him in making those first few critical decisions, those action items that Drew wants to see. And along those lines, so what we're talking about here, uh, Mike emailed in, what qualities do you think would be most important to the Cardinals in selecting the new Pope? Um, did, did you have a sense when you uh, met then Cardinal Ratzinger, like, this, this guy's got Pope material? Well, it's interesting you, you bring that up. Uh, right here on Duke's campus mm -hmm. about two weeks ago, uh, Cardinal George of Chicago was in town, and he gave an excellent presentation at, at the uh, Divinity School on uh, the church's social teaching relative to globalization. It was an excellent presentation, uh, which I think all those who were in attendance really found was sort of chock full of a lot of dense material, but really well presented. Um, but in sitting there listening to him, I was just, this man is brilliant. He's brilliant. And so I really believe that, and he, here's a man who could be the next Pope. I'm not saying that he uh -huh. will be. I'm just uh, saying that the 115 men that will sit in that room having gotten to that position without being exceptional people, exceptional human beings. And so some of the qualities that they need is they need to be men who have vision. They need to be men who can uh, appreciate the subtleties and the nuances as well as the bigger picture uh, of our faith. And they need to be very, very articulate to be able to bring a message to one billion Catholics and beyond in God knows how many languages and in God knows how many cultural uh, differences that exist throughout the world. So uh, someone who can appreciate that kind of diversity and yet still be true to a tremendous tradition which our church has, uh, it's going to take a, a really quality individual. And I, I, just the men that I've met you know, fit that bill. But you're not endorsing a candidate. I know. Okay, all right, I didn't think so. <laughs> they don't need my endorsement. Yeah. <laughs> you have been tweeting about this. Yeah. Uh, um, so, and you're on Twitter, at sure. the Duke Priest. Um, so it's it's a kind of a little primer on um, this election process. Right. And I, I think it's, 
um, it, it's not the same as, as the presidential elections that we're used to here. So um, what's the sort of bits of information you're getting out on Twitter or otherwise sort of explaining when, when people ask you what's going on there in the Vatican? Right. Yeah, my hope in using Twitter was uh, to be a resource for students. I know that they may not have the time to um, um, sort of cull the information that they might like about the process. And so I thought if I could find a way just to get some little tidbits out there, some small little snippets about how the process takes place or little factoids about uh, papal history, that that might be something that would continue to uh, maybe even pique their curiosity such that that might lend them or or uh, empower them to go and look something up. That And, and so that was my, my goal. What are you going to say in a tweet? I mean, there's just not a whole lot you can fit in there. So uh, my goal was simply just to kind of keep it out in front of them a little bit. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, it's been it's been beneficial for them. What, what about misconceptions? Again, people, you know, you say election, then it's right. like, who's your super PAC and which candidates you're right. endorsing? And, you know, when's the... Uh, you know, when do I get to cast my vote? But right. that's so what, what are some of the misconceptions you find yourself having to clear up about the way electing a pope works versus, you know, American elections? Well, I, even here at Duke, I think um, you may have seen uh, there's enough of them out there on um, uh, on the Internet. But there's, uh, you know, papal brackets the way we do for the, the you know, final the four. Yeah. Final four. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, with all kinds of creative ways, the sweet Sistine and, and any of a number, which are fun and, and that's great. But I, I think it, it um, portrays a process that really doesn't exist. And that is that there's some sort of, we start out with X number and it starts to get whittled down by some sort of selection process. I, I really, that's not my sense of it. Never having been there, I, I can't speak definitively. However, I would say, there's a prayerful discernment that people of faith appreciate when it comes to making a choice of this magnitude. And so that's the, I think, the dimension of the process that I would hope people would more uh, focus upon. And that's a, a, a way in which we can participate in the process. And when I say that, what I mean is my hope is that all of us are prayerful in our support of uh, the church as it goes through this discernment process and leadership. I was speaking uh, just yesterday at the Divinity School with one of my colleagues who's a, a Methodist pastor, and he had mentioned even how at his Sunday service this past week, he had uh, prayed for uh, the Holy Spirit's work with the Catholic Church. And so I, I really have the sense that folk, you know, people of other religious faiths, religious traditions, are in prayerful support with us as we go through this time of discernment. So. I'd like just to have that focus shift a little bit from some sort of, um, you know, bracketology uh -huh. to what it truly is, which is a, a, a very intense spiritual experience that the um, the cardinals that I've spoken to, not many of them by any stretch, when they speak about the experience that they've had, they talk about it with a reverence that. Uh, is is really edifying, and so it, it takes it to another level. And it's not strictly consensus, though, and since there is voting. Yeah. Correct, there is voting. That is correct. And, and it's covered, uh, as we've been talking about, as, as a momentous historic change. But I, I'm wondering, for um, you know, a Catholic student or someone that comes to Catholic service here at Duke, what's the change that right. people might see or not see in, in right. the pews? Sure. Um, you know, the old adage, uh, "All politics is local." You know, I, I think applies a little bit here to a degree. Uh, the day after the new pope is elected, uh, I think uh, Catholic life will be pretty much unchanged for the you know the ordinary Duke student. Certainly, um, we're at a, an interim period right now in the life of the church where when we pray every day at Mass, we normally pray for the pope, and during these times, we simply eliminate that prayer. And so, most Catholics who are attending Mass today, it it breaks a certain rhythm that we're used to. And so that rhythm will be restored. So that, that's a small point, I guess, in terms of what will be different. For priests having to, you know, not say Benedict our Pope to change that, you know, becomes a little bit of a, a challenge. But more importantly, I don't expect life for most Catholics, whether it be a student here on Duke's campus or Catholics anywhere, to see their 
their faith lives being dramatically changed. I think I heard uh, Cardinal uh, Dolan from New York in an interview just the other day talking about how we're still unpacking the legacy of John Paul II, and he died eight years ago. And so the church sees uh, or, or moves at sort of a glacial pace. And so uh, I, I think it may be still time for us to still understand the, the legacy and, and what Benedict the Sixteenth has given to our church. So certainly a new pope and what that will mean for uh, for regular Catholics like us on the street, I, I'm I think it's going to take a little longer than a few weeks or months, even years. And talking about people in the pews, again, when um, the papal elections get reported on, oftentimes there's this subplot of, you know, the the hierarchies disconnected from the laity sure. and a recent poll shows and, you know, sure. birth control and abortion and gender. I mean, the, the right. sort of issues of the day. And you're sort of, you're, you're mediating that relationship. Sure. I mean, you're between the bishops and the uh, the people in the congregation so how do you how do you see that um, connection between you know views of the laity and teachings of the leadership? Sure, you know I don't know that I would necessarily accept the the, the assumption or the presupposition that the hierarchy is disconnected from the faithful. I think that that makes good news, and I think uh, people like to say that um, as much as they might like to say the same thing about you know the president. Does he know? you know, how much a loaf of bread costs. You know, the, the, I don't know that they're fair uh, statements. Similarly, similarly, you know, the the, the bishops that, that I know are, are men of faith who deeply desire to be connected with the faithful and who themselves are trying to live the faith. So to say that somehow they're distant from that reality, I don't know that that's necessarily fair. That being said, I do appreciate that there are certain issues that uh, some Catholics see differently than the teaching office of the church. And I think that that's the tension of faith being lived. And uh, what I think is beautiful about that is that I'm, I'm always impressed by people who see things differently, but don't bolt for the door, but rather try to still find a place for themselves within the church, try to give voice to what it is they you know, understand. How do you and, handle that pastorally when, you know, oh, some, sure. someone says, no, I, I disagree with the church on this right, one. Right. What's your, do you say, sure, fine, believe whatever you want, or do you say, sorry, you know, the teaching is the teaching? Right. I, I, I don't think I would ever say to myself, let alone anyone else, sure, fine, believe whatever you want, because the minute I say that, what I'm saying is I'm creating the Mike Martin religion, which I, that's not what I'm really interested in. Uh, what I do uh, challenge myself and challenge others who speak to me, and, and it depends on the moment. I have to say pastorally, there are times when people are speaking out of hurt or they're speaking out of anger or they're speaking out of uh, disillusionment or whatever. And sometimes in those moments, the most appropriate thing to do is just to listen. And so I have to pick and choose my moments. And I try to encourage, how can we speak multiple times? Because oftentimes what sort of what the media would like is, a quick snippet of a response and think that I'm going to be able to change your mind on a particular issue of church teaching in a, in a three or four minute, you know, cocktail conversation. That's just not going to happen. And so, but I do believe that all of us, uh, regardless of the issue that we might be speaking about, uh, have to try and appreciate that or be open to the possibility that the church may be a, a tad wiser than me. And that's been my experience, and that's what I try and share with people who see things a little bit differently in the hopes that over time that wisdom will shine through. And, and talking about your role as a pastor, mm -hmm. uh, of course, you're, you're preaching regularly. Sure. And this last Sunday, we're in Lent. There's right. a, a theme of, of repentance. And uh, you were using, surprise, surprise, a basketball analogy here. Go figure. So, yeah. so let's, let's pick this up. This is... Father Mike Martin preaching this last Sunday at Duke Chapel and an analogy here with um, the Duke men's basketball recent loss to Virginia and how uh, their coach might have responded. Let's listen to that. Oh, that after that game Thursday night, he was in their face telling them what they had to change in no uncertain terms. That it was very clear to them the mistakes they had made and if they wanted to improve, this is what they were going to have to do. Very clear, you've got to change your way. Can't sugarcoat it, you gotta change or you will lose. It's that message that 
I think our scriptures call us to think about tonight, even though that's not necessarily a message we like to hear. But it's real clear. If we want to continue losing in sin, if we want sin after sin after sin, then don't change. Just keep doing what you're doing. But rather, if you'd like to stop the losing streak, if you'd like, like to stop the sinning streak at one, the change word is a little different in tonight's scriptures. It's this word. Repent. It was Catholic Center preaching this past Sunday in Duke Chapel. And, and Father Mike, um, it, it brings up the point there, you know, you're in a particular place in campus with the culture, so you're, you're adapting some of the culture in your preaching, but, uh, but you're also challenging some of, some of the campus norms. I mean, can you talk about that role as a priest and pastor where you're kind of fitting in, um, but, uh, you know, in, in wearing a habit, uh, you're not fitting in. I mean, what, sure. how, how do you walk that line? Yeah, you know, I... I I hope, you know, I know I don't walk it uh, perfectly. You know, I, I believe that um, our church teaches us, uh, uh, and certainly I think the message that we've had since the Second Vatican Council from our, our church, church teaching to engage the culture. You know, we're not, um, uh, we're always called to challenge the culture where, you know, where we see it sort of straying from what we believe to be uh, what God's calling us to. But at the same time, you know, certainly from a Franciscan perspective, you know, we believe and try and focus a lot on the incarnation that uh, Jesus came to be with us in the reality in which we find ourselves. And so his very coming to earth, you know, sanctifies all that we do each and every day. And so I try and um, take that approach here on campus. You know, students are going to find themselves doing lots of wild, exciting, interesting things. And I, I would hate if all they do is segment that somehow differently from their spiritual lives, imagining that the two never intersect. But rather, what I, I really believe they, they need to be doing is realizing that, you know, that kind of schizophrenia does just that. It just creates division even within ourselves. And what I believe that we're called to more is to take our spiritual journey to the rest of our lives and be able to see God's presence in all that we do each and every day, whether or not you're, you know, getting lunch at ABP in the Bryan Center or whether you're, uh, you know, in, in the library or whether you're in a lab or whether you're uh, in the middle of Cameron screaming like a madman, excited about, you know, a big win over Miami. So uh, I, I think we always have to be asking ourselves, how can we engage the culture rather than setting ourselves up as distinct? That being said, we realize that the message of our faith is a little different. And I believe sometimes, you know, my own garb mm -hmm. is, might be a reminder of that. And, and so you should just, on the garb, uh, you're a member of the conventual Franciscans. That's correct. And this is the dress that everyone in the That's order correct. wears. Okay. Right. And, and so what in particular at Duke, you've been here three years That's now. Right. Um, you've, you've had a chance to observe the campus culture. I mean, where, where are some places where you feel like right on, I'm going to join in and, and participate? And where do you challenge either, you know, students or, 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 the, or the university and say, you know, hold on here. I, I don't like where this is going. Are there sure. particular sort of points there? You know, I don't want to beat the usual drum. Mm -hmm. I, I, what I do see is what I believe is one of the blessings of, of the culture here at Duke, I think is also can be a curse. And it's interesting, just yesterday, uh, we had a uh, religious life meeting where representatives from the 27 different religious denominations on campus, we meet uh, every other Thursday morning. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great conversation. One of the things we were just talking about is how driven our students are and what a great gift that is. These are very talented, you know, awesome people who got to this place by being driven to a certain extent. At the same time, sort of the negative underbelly of that is that there's the sense that we have to do everything. I've got to do it all. And I just don't know that that's possible, number one. And what I also believe that it does is it, it gives students an unrealistic a sense of what the rest of their lives are supposed to be, trying to get some of our students just to slow down. You don't, you don't have to do it all. Everything doesn't have to be, 
you know, a resume builder. You can relax a little bit. You can take some downtime. You're still going to be an excellent student. You're still going to be an, a, a fantastic graduate. You're still going to have a, a wonderful life. You don't have to do it all. And I think that's um, a part of our culture that I think is a little bit of a blessing and a curse. And, and an interesting example of this sort of uh, intersection of cultures is uh, in, in February, two religious festivals, if you will, fell on the same day, Ash Wednesday right. and the UNC game. Sure. And so how did uh, the Catholic Center respond? You know, I, I, don't fight City Hall. I mean, I, I know that we normally have uh, uh, Ash Wednesday on uh, at 7.30 at night, and I knew if I had our Ash Wednesday Mass and do chapel at 7.30, I'd be there by myself. So, Nine o'clock game. Right, 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 right exactly. So, uh, so what we did was we had our regular noon service in Duke Chapel, and then through the uh, graciousness of uh, Coach Cutcliffe over at the in the football program, they offered us a space in the Yo Football Center. Uh, their part, their smaller turf field in that building, and we had two of our masses ver- right there adjacent to Kayville, and uh, so it gave students an opportunity to not have to travel far. We were right there. We did two afternoon services so that they could get back into line, and actually the line monitors helped us and, and worked a little bit with us, so we were grateful for that accommodation. And then there were photos of students right, with, with their, their blue face paint and their ashes <laughs> in, at the game. Yeah. Um, so another email question, uh, you know, going back to where we started sure. with electing a new pope, um, how likely is the possibility that the pope will be selected from Africa, South America, in recognition of the large African American Hispanic population? So again, not, not that you necessarily have insider information, right, right. but the, the symbolism of the, the pope's ethnicity and in, in, in home country in sure. this process. You know, certainly, um, I think we have seen the uh, the last two popes have broke a, a pretty long tradition of Italians, uh, and so we've had two more Euro- Europeans in our last uh, last two popes. That it could be someone from Africa, that it could be someone from Asia, certainly, I think is a possibility. I, I'm not a handicapper. I just, you know, I don't uh, don't feel that that's really my gift, so I'm not necessarily going to go there. But I, I certainly, certainly the church is emerging uh, strongly in those areas of the world, and, and, and we have some great leadership. Uh, Cardinal Turkson from Ghana, uh, I've had the opportunity to meet wonderful man, and, uh, you know, is you know, one of those who's considered and right. running a little bit. But the old adage is the, the one who goes in a pope comes out a bishop. So uh, <laughs> don't want don't to curse anybody. Jinx Good. them. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. And so, so to take us out here, um, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll let the uh, the cardinals do their business here, sure. right at this moment in the, in the Vatican. But um, it's Lent, right. and uh, a typical time of, of fasting and prayer. Mm-hmm. Now, you're not going to say what you've given up mm-hmm. uh, for for Lent, but um, you know, suggestions for if if people late in the game want to give something up fast sure. uh, until Easter, what guidance do you give when people say, "I don't know, Father, what should I right. what should I give up?" Great question, particularly on the the lateness of it. I, you know, I'd say if it's the last day of Lent, you still want to do it. Do whatever you can. But the one thing I challenge our students to is not to do something that's the pro forma just for the sake, oh, I've always given up chocolate. I always say, link it to something that you're working on in your own life. Try and make it something that you're is going to impact you personally, that, that is much easier to connect. Giving up chocolate, I, I'm not quite sure how I connect that to my own life other than maybe I should drop a few pounds. I mean, I would rather say if I'm really dealing with issues where I find myself being critical of others, then maybe a better penance is I'm going to make certain that uh, each day I find something positive to say to someone else about how, you know, what they mean to me or whatever. Small acts of kindness like that that are related to areas in my life where I need growth, I think making that connection is far more important. Good. Well, Father Mike Martin, thank you for coming on Office Hours and having this conversation. My pleasure. Father Michael Martin is the director of the Duke Catholic Center, and he is online on Twitter at the Duke Priest. He is tweeting about the papal elections with the tag Pope Tweets. There'll be a recording of this Office Hours conversation, along with many other Duke videos on the Duke On Demand website. That is ondemand.duke.edu. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.